The accused, Neil Epstein, is charged with criminal harassment and uttering death threats towards his neighbor, Michael Nakache. The alleged events occurred between March and May of 2021. Picture the following scene. A beautiful spring day, a quiet street in a small residential neighborhood, just steps away from two elementary schools, a daycare, and a park. Up the road, a four-year-old girl rides her scooter in front of her house, with three adults sitting on camping chairs in their driveway watching her. Said driveway is adorned with chalk drawings made by the child. A few meters away, another gathering of nine children spanning ages two to eight. Smiles from ear to ear. Some have bicycles, some have scooters. All are wearing helmets. Other children are simply walking, playing, getting much-needed fresh air. They are all under the watchful eye of their parents. Nearby are balloons and decorations in front of a home. Some snow is still seen melting. This is after COVID lockdowns had kept kids cooped up inside for far too long and while onerous curfews were still active. Finally, the kids could play during the daytime and interact with one another. On the street, there are chalk drawings made by children depicting a birthday cake and spelling Happy Fifth. Around the corner, various other adults and children are walking on the street, some are walking their dogs, everyone is smiling. At a later point, a young father holds his toddler in his arms. To most, this scene represents a blissful snapshot of a suburban utopia, peaceful, friendly community life. Yet to the complainant and his family, this is an unbearable nuisance, an affront on many levels. So much so that according to the objective video evidence, they drive dangerously near the children as a way to protest their presence and express their discontent. That is the backdrop of this case. The complainants have a list of grievances against the accused, his family, his young children, and the other neighbor's young children. These grievances are nothing more than mundane, petty neighborhood trivialities. The complainants have consistently videotaped their neighbors, yet they charge Mr. Epstein with criminal harassment. With an irony of unmatched proportions, they complain that he might have recorded them. He did not. To the complainants, the presence of young families outside of it is a source of scorn and vivid resentment that ultimately spilled over into a criminal complaint against their neighbor, a schoolteacher, a caring father of two young daughters who committed no crime whatsoever, a man who has somehow been subjected to criminal charges for almost two years. This injustice ends today. After Mr. Epstein testified in chief in a tremendous display of professionalism and objectivity, Crown Counsel declined to cross-examine him, since in her view it was not in the public interest to do so. Instead, she humbly invited the court to enter an acquittal. Having heard the evidence, I can unreservedly confirm that she made the right call. Counsel's integrity was commendable. For reasons explained below, the court is resoundingly acquitting the accused. Since I'm hesitant to draft an entire decision in bold and caps lock characters, I offer the following observations instead. It is deplorable that the complainants have weaponized the criminal justice system in an attempt to exert revenge on an innocent man for some perceived slights that are, at best, trivial peeves. The interested parties live on Watford Street in Beaconsfield. It is a small, narrow road without sidewalks. It is barely ten houses long, and it contains a horseshoe turn. Michael Nakache is a 34-year-old man. He has a large build, albeit somewhat smaller than the accused's. Nakache lives with his brother Ari, who also has a heavy-set frame, his father Frank, and his mother Martine. Nakache has installed four closed-circuit cameras filming the front of his house at all times. He has also installed two dashboard cameras in his parents' vehicles, a third rear-facing camera in his father's car, and a high-resolution camera on his motorcycle helmet. Between March and May of 2021, he monitored these cameras for any sign of the accused and his family. The event that allegedly triggered the focus on the Epsteins was an altercation that occurred in March. 
However, the evidence shows that the Epsteins were on the Nakache's radar far before that. Michael alleges that on several occasions, the accused tried to record his family while passing by on the street. The complainant described a series of events in his testimony. The Crown also filed video surveillance footage extracted from the complainant's eight cameras. Finally, with the defense's consent, and as a footnote here, the document would have been prohibited under both the hearsay rule and the rule against self-serving evidence, Nevertheless, the defense agreed that it could be filed as evidence. Having reviewed the document, I can understand why. The Crown also produced a written journal compiled by the complainant in which he kept a log documenting each event. The log in question is replete with his editorial comments and opinions about his neighbors. Below, for each event, The court will separately summarize the complainant's viva voce description, or I guess uh, out loud, followed by what the video footage actually depicted. As will be seen, the differences are sometimes staggering. Starting with the assault on March 25th, 2021. The children had gathered in front of the accused house. The image described in these reasons preamble generally refers to that scene. Mr. Nakache describes it as follows. They were having a street party, blocking the street while drinking at the height of the pandemic. They were having a party in the middle of the street, right at the end of a blind curve. He mentions that there are toys left in the middle of the road. He adds that the adults are holding cans that seem like alcohol, and they're clearly blocking the streets. Moreover, there's a bunch of toys on the road and drawings right at the exit of a blind curve. The video evidence paints a starkly different picture. The scene is far less pernicious than he portrays it to be. First, this reference to a party in the middle of the street is a complete misnomer. It implies some block party or an effort to actually stop traffic. In reality, it was simply some children playing on the road. Moreover, the reference to having a party in the blind curve is misleading. The road is small, narrow, and slow by its very design. There is no danger that the kids will be blindsided by a car. It is broad daylight. The curve is not blind. The location of the playing families is in no way inappropriate. The drawings are not graffiti. They are children's chalk drawings. Sidewalk chalk is sold at every Canadian tire, Walmart, and dollar store in the country. The court does not see cans. At most, it sees one can in the accused's hand, and it can certainly not conclude that it is cans of alcohol, which is what the complainant presumes. Moreover, even assuming it is a beer, this is a far cry from concluding that the accused is intoxicated, which is what the complainant's comment implies without any basis. There are no toys left in the middle of the road. There is a scooter on the side of the road when Frank Nakache passes, which does not impede traffic in any way. Moreover, the scooter is not abandoned or forgotten. The kids are outside, right next to it. From the very beginning of his testimony, the complainant refers to the incident in March during which the accused assaulted his parents on their front porch. To be clear, Mr. Epstein is not, and was never, charged with that supposed assault. Nevertheless, on four occasions, Nikache repeated that the accused had assaulted his parents or assaulted his father on March 25th, 2021. Michael Nikache is not seen in that video. In his testimony, he mentions that he was just inside the house, near the front door, on the phone with the police, yet he claims not to have heard anything that was said, despite the fact that everyone was speaking loudly. He is the one that called the police. He laments that the officers decided not to do anything about it. But the video evidence. After Frank Nikache drives near the children and parks his car in his driveway, two concerned and angry fathers approach his house. Mr. Epstein is one of them. The argument is boisterous. As the parties yell at each other, Mr. Epstein holds his phone in plain sight and records the conversation. The complainant's description of the events, even when confronted with the video footage, conveniently omits to mention a few key details, all of which are damaging to his version, including the following. 
Dash cam footage shows Martine Nakache driving home at 5.41 p.m. As she turns on to Charleswood Drive, there is a young girl, approximately four years old, on a scooter crossing the road. The child sees Martine's car and quickly reacts, frazzled at first. After a momentary stumble, the child moves to the left, getting out of her way. Martine Nakache never slows down her car. Instead, the little girl is left to her own devices, quickly pushing her scooter, narrowly avoiding being hit. This unidentified child is not even related to the gathering on Watford Street. This clip thus corroborates the accused's subsequent testimony when he states that the Nakaches are reckless on the road and that they drive with disregard for the welfare of the neighborhood's children. As soon as Martine Nakache approaches the children's gathering on Watford Street, their respective parents immediately take their kids and direct them out of the way to clear a path for the car. The entire inconvenience lasts 10 seconds. Dashcam footage shows Frank Nakache driving home at 6.46 p.m. The gathering is far smaller than it was earlier. There are only four kids on the scene and three fathers. As soon as Nakache is in sight, the children immediately start to move out of the way to clear a path. Yet Frank Nakache does not slow his speed. In fact, Mr. Epstein gestures to him to slow down. Another father, Nick Kemp, is holding a baby in his arms. With a look of outrage in his face, Kemp lifts and extends his leg towards the car to show Nakache that he is driving way too close and that he is practically touching him. The footage from Frank Nakache's rear-facing camera confirms decisively that he did not slow his speed when approaching the children. The brake light barely appears for a fraction of a second. In fact, at the tenth second of the video clip, we see that Frank Nakache's car passed just inches away from the accused. Moreover, as he approaches, Frank Nakache is having a conversation with his wife on his Bluetooth speaker. When he sees the group of people, he angrily complains to his wife, Look at this! Look at this! They're all in the middle of the road again! He deliberately and spitefully chooses to keep driving towards them in an act of defiance. Footnote 9. I note that at the opening of the trial, the parties expressed that the audio portion of the clip was inadmissible since it constituted hearsay. Upon review, Frank Nikache's utterances do not constitute hearsay. They do not recount an event that is offered for the truth of its contents. Instead, his utterances are relevant and admissible as contemporaneous expressions of his state of mind. As soon as Frank Nakache exits his car, he is the one aggressively pointing to Mr. Epstein. The accused's first movement is to raise an open hand and make a calm down motion. Neil Epstein never touched anyone. He committed no assault whatsoever. Instead, Ari Nakache pushed Mr. Epstein, who did not reply. Everyone at the scene was angry, yelling, and pointing at each other. After the police attended the scene, no arrests were made. This displeased Mr. Nakache. The following day, he called the police again in order to press further about Mr. Epstein being charged. In his journal, he noted the names of the officers he spoke to. Unrelenting, he called the police again on March 27th for the same purpose, once again noting the officer's name. In his testimony, Nakache simply says that the police treated it like a neighborly dispute and accordingly declined to press the matter further. They were not keen of processing a harassment complaint. However, he conveniently omits mentioning what he noted in his written log. The log reveals that, to his dismay, the police officer informed him that his brother Ari could have been charged with assault and his father Frank could have been ticketed for driving dangerously. In his notes, Nakache took the officer's warning as a threat. He also complained that the officers did nothing about Mr. Epstein not wearing a COVID mask outdoors. The filming of their home on March 27th. The complainant's testimony. As Ari Nakache was moving the cars in their driveway, the accused was walking by with his wife and children. As he approached, Mr. Epstein was already filming the complainant's house. For some reason, he then stopped in the driveway of the house across the street. From there, he kept filming the complainant's home. But what does the video evidence say? At 10.13 a.m., Mr. Epstein, his wife, and their two young daughters, aged two and four, are walking southbound. The kids are wearing raincoats and little rain boots. Their mother pulls a red wagon. They are on the opposite side of the road, nowhere near the Nakache house. 
unprompted, both kids run onto the driveway of something towards the house. The evidence later reveals that this is where the children's friend, V, lives. The little girl simply wanted to talk to their friend. Oh, the horror. The Epstein parents wait on the driveway for 19 seconds for their daughters to come back and continue their walk. During the entire walk, Mr. Epstein does nothing. He walks normally. It is uneventful. He makes no gesture or sign towards the complainant's house. He may be holding a phone in his hand, but it is simply along his thigh. Moreover, as he walks, he swings his arms normally, which is not conducive to surreptitious filming, unless it is his goal to make a motion sickness-inducing film. During the wait on the driveway, his hand is near his belly, immobile. Given the distance and the resolution of the video, the court is unable to conclude that he was filming. When describing the events of March 27th, the complainant refers to the accused as dipshit. The filming of their home on April 3rd. The complainant's testimony was that the accused was staring at his house as he walked by, and he was trying to hide the fact that he was recording it. But the video evidence shows that at 12.37 p.m., Mr. Dicace is outside on his front porch as the accused walks on the street northbound on the opposite side of the road, nowhere near the complainant's house. Mr. Nakache is staring down the accused the entire time. The accused never stops or slows down. He does not say anything to the complainant. Mr. Epstein has an object in his right hand. As he walks, his left arm is swinging, but his right arm appears to be fixed in a downward position. The complainant extracted three zoomed-in screenshots in order to show that the accused is holding a phone in his right hand, which is later admitted by the accused. The complainant's written log shows the complainant again refers to the accused as dipshit and suggests that he is insane. April 4th, complainant's testimony. A young boy passed by the house and pretended to shoot Frank Nicatre with a hockey stick, pointing it like a firearm. The complainant does not know who the boy is, although he has often seen him on the street and he believes that the child was present during the March 25th gathering. It warrants mention that the accused does not have a son. The boy in the video is unidentified. There is no evidence whatsoever linking Mr. Epstein to the young boy. The complainant adds that on April 4th, the accused and his wife stared at his house as they walked on the street. He further alleges that Mr. Epstein was pretending to be on his phone. But the video evidence shows. At 10.19 a.m., the accused and his family are quietly walking southbound on the road. The kids are slightly ahead of them, but still within a few feet. They never stop walking. They never say or do anything in the direction of the complainant's house. At 10.19.08, for a fraction of a second, Mr. Epstein turns his head to the right. If you blink, you miss it. No level-headed person could describe this as, he kept staring at the house, which is how the accused described it in his written log. Furthermore, from that distance, it is simply impossible to assert that the accused was pretending to be on his phone. At 1.02 p.m., the accused and his wife are walking northbound on the road. They are on the opposite side of the street, nowhere near the complainant's house. Each parent is carrying one daughter in their arms. They never stop. They never say or do anything in the direction of the house. At 1.33 p.m., a young boy, approximately 10, runs on the street northbound holding a hockey stick. He momentarily stops, pretends to take aim with a rifle, and shoot in the direction of the complainant's house. Regarding that morning encounter, the complainant writes that the accused kept staring at the house, and kids were running around throughout the whole road and screaming. As for 1.32 p.m., he mentions the kid with the hockey stick. The events of April 8th. Complainant's testimony... The complainant was returning home on his motorcycle. By sheer coincidence, he found himself behind the accused's car. After several blocks following the same path, when the accused arrived at his house, he slowed down and stopped on the road, but did not enter his own driveway. Instead, he slowly advanced to the horseshoe turn and stopped on the left side in the blind curve in the opposite traffic lane. At that point, the complainant passed him on the right and headed home, a few meters away. During that short distance, the accused slowly followed him home and kept going. Mr. Nakache stresses that driving on the opposite lane of traffic is extremely unusual, 
While the accused's car was behind him, he felt very vulnerable and did not know what to do. Even after he had entered his driveway and was safely surrounded by his family's cars, Nikache was supposedly still afraid and confused. He did not know what was going to happen. Despite the presence of other cars, there was still an open spot on the driveway from which he could be run over. He adds, if somebody wanted to drive their car like the bus in Laval recently that intentionally murdered young children by driving into a daycare center, it's going to hit. But the video evidence shows that the accused was already stopped at a red light on St. Charles Boulevard when the complainant pulled up behind him. The encounter was a mere coincidence. Both vehicles head to their respective homes. Mr. Epstein's car momentarily stops in front of his own house, then moves forward and stops on the left side of the road for a few seconds. This is nowhere near the complainant's house. Technically, he is on the opposite side of the road. However, it is a stretch to assert that he is opposite traffic. As mentioned above, the road is very narrow. It is barely two car widths wide. Moreover, there is no painted median line. Rather, the maneuver resembles one of moving aside to let the motorcycle behind pass, which it does. Mr. Epstein's vehicle makes no hostile or dangerous movement. As soon as the complainant's motorcycle passes him, Mr. Epstein continues southbound on the road without incident. In his log, the complainant states that the accused is seen blowing every stop sign over the speed limit in quite a few spots. Later he writes, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Having reviewed the evidence, the court did not see Mr. Epstein blowing any stop signs or driving dangerously. Moreover, ironically, on at least one occasion, the complainant's helmet camera films his own motorcycle speedometer, which has a digital display and shows him driving at 70 kilometers an hour, well above the posted speed limit. The events of May 12th, 2021. The accused appeared to be looking into the house and attempting to see inside the upper floor's windows. After a minute or so, he continued walking, only to hide behind a tree and continue looking at the house. But the video evidence shows that at 3.53 p.m., the accused and his family are quietly walking southbound on the road. They didn't stop walking. At one point, the accused does wait for his young child to catch up to them. Although Mr. Epstein is, in fact, looking in the direction of the complainant's house, he makes no menacing motion. The walk lasts only a few seconds and is uneventful. At no point does anyone hide behind any branches. When describing the May 12th incident, the complainant refers to Mr. Epstein as the crazy neighbor and states that he is insane. He suspects that Mr. Epstein is casing the place and suggests that the accused was hiding behind the tree, staring at the house. The events of May 18th. Mr. Nakache explains that he was performing renovations on his house's front staircase using a handheld jackhammer. He was wearing safety glasses and earplugs. Through his earplugs, he thought he heard a sound. He therefore turned around and saw the accused, who appeared to be saying something. The accused kept walking while staring at the complainant and giving him the finger. Moments later, the accused crossed both arms, giving him the finger with both hands. As he walked away, Epstein made a throat-slashing gesture. Finally, after walking a few steps, the accused turned around and made a punching motion with his hand, as if to challenge him to a fight. Nikache therefore set his jackhammer down and called police to report what he perceived as a threat to his life. He also reported what he considered to be months of harassment. He felt worried to such a degree that he feared, was he going to come back? Was he going to try and kill me? But the video evidence shows that at 2.43 p.m., Mr. Epstein is seen walking southbound on the road. He is walking on the opposite side of the road, nowhere near the complainant's house. He never stops walking. The video clearly shows that Epstein is looking in the complainant's direction and giving him the finger, sometimes with both hands. At the tail end of the clip, the accused makes a lateral horizontal motion with his right hand. I'm assuming he went like this and not like this. Difference, right? Like, hey, stop it versus I want to cut your throat. And so that's the end of the uh, evidence evaluation. Now the judge is going to start talking about the testimony. Mr. Epstein testified in his defense. At the time of the events, his daughters were two and four years old. 
His family is very outdoorsy. They go for walks every day. He describes the neighborhood as quiet, friendly, and residential. As Exhibit D1, he produces a map of the surrounding streets upon which he identifies most of his neighbors, all within a distance of a stone's throw. He lists 12 houses and he identifies the residents, all of which he socializes with. He even knows their pets' names. Everyone knows everyone. The community is tight-knit. Nine of those households have young children, and they are all friends with his daughters. They often gather, have pizza parties, play in the street, and go swimming in each other's pools. At trial, there is no evidence before me suggesting these young children form a criminal or terrorist organization. For some time, the neighborhood parents have noticed that the members of the Nakache family drive too fast and too close to the children. On March 25th, while the kids were playing in front of his house, he heard one of the mothers scream to alert him about an oncoming car. It was Martin Nikache approaching. Although the children and the parents moved aside, Martin continued to drive aggressively, passing far too close to them. Later that day, the same thing occurred with Frank Nikache, who drove extremely close to the children. Understandably, the accused became upset and decided to confront Frank in order to implore him to slow down. After all, this was a recurring problem. He jogged over to his house, slowing down to a walking pace as he arrived. As soon as Frank exited his car, red in the face, he aggressively yelled, I'll hit them next time. The accused tried to place his hand up and say, stop, listen, but to no avail. Frank continued yelling that it would be all the parents' fault if he ever hit one of the kids with his car. He yelled that they should go play somewhere else. The verbal argument moved to the front porch. All of a sudden, Ari Nakache exited the house and yelled, I've had to wait ten minutes for you to move in the past. An obvious exaggeration. I don't care if I smash you. The Nakache mother, Martine, then chimed in. She told them to go to the park if they wanted to play outdoors. She then scolded the accused for daring to speak English on her. En est au Quebec, par français. Mr. Epstein answered that in Canada he was free to speak English. At that moment, Ari Nakache pushed him. Afraid he would lose his job if he retaliated, Mr. Epstein simply walked away and called the police. The accused acknowledges that he was upset during the confrontation. He admits that he spoke aggressively and that he used profanity. He loves his daughters very much, and this was not the first time that Akache threatened to run them over. As for the April 8th incident, Mr. Epstein describes it as wholly uneventful. He was returning from a Costco run with his friend and neighbor Nick. The car was full of groceries. As they pulled up to Epstein's house, they briefly paused and decided that they would unload Nick's groceries at the latter's house up the street. As they discussed the spontaneous change of plans, he noticed a motorcycle behind him, so he moved to the left to let the motorcycle pass, which it did without incident. Epstein then went to Nick's house, and the evening was entirely normal. He never threatened or intimidated Nakache. He had no intention of running him over, either. As for all the other alleged incidents of surveillance, Mr. Epstein states that he was simply walking down the street with his family, which is something he routinely does. He denies having filmed the Nakache's home, although he did always keep his cell phone in his hand, just in case he needed to quickly call 911 due to their volatile behavior. Regarding the March 27th walk, he explains that they briefly stopped in front of the driveway while his daughters went to see if their friend was home. There was nothing malevolent about this mundane occurrence. On May 18th, the accused was going for a long walk. As he passed an Akache home, he saw Michael outside on his front porch holding what appeared to be a handheld drill. Michael started at him, saying, You fucking crazy neighbor, you dipshit, as he held the tool up in a menacing way, adding, You're fucking dead. Frustrated with this immature display, Mr. Epstein responded, fuck off, and proceeded to give him the finger as he walked away. As he made the gestures, he swung his right arm horizontally and outwardly in a dismissive manner. He denies having made any throat-slitting gesture or threat. After his walk, he returned home to find police officers waiting for him. They arrested him for uttering death threats. Not only did he cooperate with them, but he took his time and provided them with a voluntary statement about the events, despite his right to silence. So far, this Mr. Nakache sounds like the dipshit. 
the judge is now going to talk about the law. It is trite law that Mr. Epstein, like every other person charged with a crime, is presumed to be innocent unless and until the Crown has proven his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The Crown bears the burden of proof throughout the entire trial from beginning to end. The accused does not have to be present or prove anything. Moreover, it is not enough for the court to believe that he is probably or likely guilty. Conversely, proof establishing absolute certainty is not required of the crown, nor may doubt be imaginary, frivolous, or irrational. Such a burden would be nearly impossible to meet. Nevertheless, the reasonable doubt standard falls much closer to absolute certainty than to a proof of a balance of probabilities. The case at bar is not a close call. Reasonable doubt must stem from reason and common sense, and is logically connected to the evidence or lack thereof. It cannot be based on sympathy, pity, or prejudice. Finally, it cannot be grounded in hypotheticals, speculation, or fanciful conjecture. Credibility is a live issue in this case. The court is confronted with conflicting evidence, with the main parties offering diametrically opposed versions regarding the history of their interactions and the events referred to in the information. Although credibility and reliability are often intertwined to a certain extent, they do remain fundamentally different. Credibility relates to the witness himself and to his truthfulness, veracity, and integrity, while reliability relates to the accuracy and quality of his account. In its assessment, the court may accept all, part, or none of a witness's testimony. The court must be careful, avoiding engaging in credibility contests. In other words, a criminal allegation cannot be resolved by simply choosing between conflicting accounts. Doing so would shift the burden of proof to the accused, or lower the standard of proof resting with the Crown, both of which are scrupulously prohibited. I have instructed myself to apply the law with respect to credibility as inspired by the framework proposed by Justice Corey in R v. W. 1. If I believe the accused's evidence denying guilt, I must acquit. Two, if the evidence of the accused is not believed per se or automatically, but it nevertheless leaves the court with a reasonable doubt, I must acquit. Three, even if the evidence of the defense does not raise a reasonable doubt, i.e., even if it is dismissed as entirely untruthful, that does not end the matter. The court must then determine whether, on the basis of the evidence which is accepted, it is convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused is guilty. So the judge will now analyze these facts against the law. In a series of recent decisions, the Quebec Court of Appeal reviewed the essential elements of the offense of criminal harassment. The term harass denotes conduct that is more than just disturbing or unsettling. The provision requires that the complainant be tormented, troubled, worried continually and chronically, plagued, bedeviled, and badgered. These concepts go beyond feeling vexed, disquieted, or annoyed. That being said, the words tormented, troubled, worried continually or chronically, plagued, bedeviled, and badgered are not cumulative and are individually synonymous with the word harassed. Accordingly, establishing any of these states can constitute harassment. Moreover, it is not necessary for victims of harassment to suffer ill health or major disruption in their lives before obtaining the protection of the law. The above-mentioned principles are particularly important in the case at bar. They ensure that the strong arm of the criminal law is not unleashed on individuals for the slightest perceived insult. Without a baseline objective requirement, oversensitive people might be tempted to call the police every time someone looked at them wrong. The essential elements of the offense are as follows. One, it must be established that the accused has been engaged in the conduct set forth in the law. Two, it must be established that the complainant was harassed as a result of the behavior. Three, it must be established that the accused who engaged in such conduct knew that the complainant was harassed or was reckless or willfully blind as to whether the complainant was harassed. Four, it must be established that the conduct caused the complainant to fear for her safety or the safety of anyone known to her. This includes fear for her physical or psychological safety. And five, it must be established that the complainant's fear was, in all the circumstances, reasonable. Finally, appellate case law has long held that, as a matter of law, the offense of criminal harassment may be committed in one single incident. 
Repetitive or continuing behavior is not required to establish threatening conduct under the law. As for the offense of uttering death threats, it is the concept or idea of the threat and not the exact words used which constitute the offense. The exact words do not matter as long as the intended meaning of the threat is clear. A gesture may suffice. A gesture without words may suffice. For the offense to be made out, considering the context of the relationship and the circumstances in which the words were uttered or the gestures made, they must be objectively threatening and they must be meant to intimidate the complainant. To be sure, the gesture of slitting one's throat with a finger or thumb, depending on the circumstances, may well amount to a death threat under the law. Indeed, it is a common method of committing the offense. The Court's Conclusions The Court's fact-finding process was somewhat truncated by the fact that the accused was never cross-examined. Nevertheless, I am in a position to make factual conclusions on the basis of the evidence as a whole as I heard it. In case you're confused, the accused is the defendant, and the defendant was not cross-examined by the prosecutor. So we're not talking about the defendant not testifying, which, which is normal. It's normal for the defendant not to testify in a criminal matter, and it's kind of abnormal for a defendant to testify, although it's not uncommon. So what's remarkable here is that the prosecutor did not cross-examine the defendant who was testifying against their right to remain silent. So the defendant testified and the prosecutor did not have any questions for them on cross-examination. The court has no difficulty believing the accused. I wholeheartedly accept his testimony as truthful, which, which may be why the prosecutor did not pursue any cross-examination, because the prosecutor may have been convinced, and may, more importantly, may have been convinced that the court was convinced. The accused's answers were spontaneous, unrehearsed, simple, consistent with the video evidence, and inherently realistic. The sincerity in his voice was palpable. When recounting the events, he was very specific in describing where he was coming from, where he was going to, and why. He became visibly emotional at times. These proceedings have taken a toll on him. In particular, I believed him when he asserts that he was not filming the complainants on the impugned days. The video evidence simply does not show him filming anything. It merely shows a person walking with his cell phone in his hand. I believe the accused's denial that he made a throat-slitting gesture. The video footage is vague on that specific point, although it does show a lateral movement. This is entirely consistent with the accused's testimony. He gave Nikache the finger and swung his forearm to the right in a dismissive action, as if to express, get out of here, leave me alone, or to put it more bluntly, fuck off. The video actually shows the middle finger still extended during the lateral movement. The complainant went to great lengths to convince the court that in the footage, Mr. Epstein was in fact filming him. To bolster his claims, he took ultra-zoomed-in screenshots from the video showing basically nothing. They merely show what is patently, or outwardly clear, a guy walking up the street, sometimes with his kids, holding his phone in his hand. They do not show a 007-esque effort to film the complainant's home. Yet Mr. Nakache is persuaded that Epstein carefully placed his hands on his hips, deceptively slanting his phone camera and cunningly filming nothing of interest while still walking. These suspicions are unfounded. Secondly, had the accused been filming the home, why would he do it surreptitiously? He had no reason to hide such an action. It is not illegal to film in a public place. In fact, during the confrontation of March 25th, Mr. Epstein was in fact filming the events. He held his phone up for all to see, openly advertising that he was recording. It was the responsible, mature thing to do. It was entirely reasonable to record the argument in order to ensure that it was accurately documented, lest the complainants later claim that he threatened to firebomb their home or drive a bus through it. To be clear, this reference is insensitive and appalling. I mention it because, as seen below, Mr. Nakache raised it during his testimony. To say it was in poor taste would be a tremendous understatement. Third, he had no reason whatsoever to record the complainants in the first place. What could possibly be gained from filming a house facade? No rational motive was advanced by the Crown or by the complainant. The court accepts Mr. Epstein's account as truthful. 
I believe his account of the events of March 25th and May 18th. I also believe his description of the statements made by Frank Arry and Martin Nakache. They are consistent with their behavior and their driving patterns in the video evidence, which show a disregard for the individuals on the street and a spiteful attitude of, you move, I'm driving. Not just bikes would eat his heart out. All that is sufficient to end the analysis under step one of the seminal R versus WD. It is nevertheless appropriate to assess the evidence of the prosecution. After all, the accused's testimony is to be analyzed within the evidence as a whole, not in isolation. Having heard the testimony and carefully reviewed the audiovisual evidence, the court does not believe Mr. Nakache. It rejects his testimony as rehearsed, evasive, and untruthful on many levels. From early on in his account, long before his cross-examination even began, it became readily apparent that he had a penchant for exaggeration and misrepresentation. This is the judge saying that he's revealing these negative things about himself during direct examination, his own examination, not even the defense's cross-examination, where, where the defense is the hostile party, you know? Some of his claims were inherently implausible. Others starkly contradicted the video evidence, which was odd considering the fact that he was the one who provided footage to the police. It was his video evidence that he's contradicting. He was at times carefully selective about what he disclosed to the court and what he did not. For instance, even though the court had his written statement, which was produced on consent, when asked to describe its contents, he left out many features that were detrimental to his claims or that shed him in a negative light. So that's his journal, I think, right? So he let them use his journal, or I guess they can. the defense consented to the use of the journal, and then he contradicted his own journal in his testimony. This is like, this is like the epitome of a Karen. This is the ultimate Karen. Yes, can, Canadian judge smacks down ultimate Karen. Something like that. Finally, his characterization of the accused's behavior was grossly inaccurate. Even mundane actions by Epstein, such as taking a walk with his young children, was described by Nakache as an act of confrontation, if not an all-out aggression. These glaring exaggerations may have been a product of an unjustified hypersensitivity on the part of the complainant and his family. At times, the claims bordered on paranoia. The exaggerations may also have been the result of malicious deceit before the court. In my view, in light of the evidence as a whole, I conclude that the exaggerations stemmed from a mix of both. There was certainly animus on the part of the complainant that provided him with ample motive to take liberties with the truth. It is clear that the Nakache family hates the accused. There was an attempt to downplay the animus in examination-in-chief. Michael Nakache claimed to not have any issues with Epstein, yet he quickly added that his only issue was that he had a tendency to leave trash on the street. Recall that Epstein was not even his next-door neighbor. He lived further up the road. In any event, even the expression trash on the street was an exaggeration. The court itself sought to clarify what he meant by it. The complainant answered that the accused garbage can and recycling bin sometimes protruded onto the curb, whereas they should have been entirely in his driveway. In other words, upon further questioning, Mr. Epstein did not leave trash in the street. He did what thousands of other people do, yet to Nakache, this was stupid and dangerous. The following day, in examination-in-chief, direct examination, he was asked again how he felt about Mr. Epstein. He answered that he had mixed feelings, just confusion. I wouldn't call it hate or being upset. In his view, the accused was a bully. When asked point blank in cross-examination if he disliked Mr. Epstein, the complainant refused to acknowledge the obvious. Instead, he skirted the question, and after some noticeable hesitation, he gave unconvincing answers. Recall that this is a man that he called crazy and insane in his journal. He nicknamed him dipshit. He testified that he was a bad parent and a negligent, dangerous citizen. Nikache carefully monitored his movements on his multiple video cameras. He accused Mr. Epstein of being capable of intentionally running him over with his car while on his motorcycle. In other words, in his view, Mr. Epstein was capable of murder, no less. Still, 
under oath, Nikache was unwilling to admit the basic fact that he disliked the accused. He even claimed that dipshit's not really an insult. It's merely a nickname like any other, an innocuous form of slang. This excessive attempt to project a good image of himself by denying the obvious caused irreparable harm to his credibility. Similarly, the complainant had an immediate explanation for every apparent incoherence or frailty in his account. He was resolutely unwilling to acknowledge even clear, uncontroversial facts. For instance, the video evidence unquestionably shows that during the March 25th confrontation on his front porch, everyone was angrily pointing their finger at everyone. This includes his mother, his brother Ari, and his father. In fact, his father, Frank Nicace, was the first one to point the finger at anyone. He did so immediately upon exiting his vehicle. Despite the video that was clear as day, and that he had watched multiple times, including in open court, when asked if his family had also pointed their finger, he refused to acknowledge it. Instead, he hesitated and gave insipid answers like, not really, or uh, I didn't notice. This prompted the court to interrupt his testimony, remind him of his oath to tell the truth, and stress the importance of these proceedings. On a related note, even after the video, played in open court, unequivocally showed that his father had driven too fast and too close to the children, Nikache refused to acknowledge it. Instead, he claimed that the video made him feel ambiguous, and he then quickly cast the blame on the two fathers who were trying to protect their children. The complainant expresses that it was weird for Epstein to be recording the argument on March 25th, this coming from the man who installed eight cameras to record and document his neighbor's every movement. Mr. Nakache claims that Mr. Epstein tried to look in through his home's second floor windows. He asserts that the accused approached his house to do so. Alas, the video evidence shows these claims are demonstrably false. He repeatedly claimed that his father was assaulted by the accused on March 25th. This was not a matter of diverging interpretations of the same video sequence. The complainant stated one thing, the video evidence showed the very opposite. It was Ari Nakache, a heavyset man, who pushed Mr. Epstein. That was the only physical assault that took place on March 25th. In a remarkable exercise of restraint and cool temperament, the accused did not strike him back. He walked away. He chose words over physical violence. I do not believe Michael Nakache's claim that he did not hear the conversation on the front porch. He was right inside, just behind the door, which incidentally was opened several times by his mother and brother. Given the fact that they were all shouting, it is impossible that he did not hear what was said. Instead, the court is convinced that he, in fact, did hear the exchange, but he did not want to admit it, since his parents' utterances were consistent with the accused's allegations, i.e., they boasted that they would not slow down their driving in the presence of the children. The claim that the accused was hiding behind branches watching his home is nothing more than a figment of the complainant's imagination. As for the events of May 18th, I do not believe that the accused made punching motions to him, challenging him to a fight. According to the complainant's own account, this punching gesture and challenging to fight was made by the accused after he had walked far away from him. In fact, he's no longer even in the camera's frame. Epstein was already across the street, nowhere near the complainant, as he was walking even farther away. Had the accused wanted to challenge him to a fight, he would have had to do so when he was closer. After all, he walked by the house. At the very least, he would have had to approach the accused, not move farther away. Moreover, it would be nonsensical to challenge the accused to a fist fight when the latter is armed with a jackhammer that could be used as a weapon. The court does not believe that Nakache feared the accused might come back and kill me on May 18th. This was no more than a rehearsed line. Such a fear is blatantly exaggerated and fundamentally unfounded. In fact, the court does not believe that he was scared at all. It was not fear that prompted the call to the police. It was spite and contempt. Strangely, in an attempt to show the court that he does not overreact to situations, Mr. Nakache claimed that he is a genuinely calm person and that he has seen far worse things in his life. This was not the first time he saw a crime in progress. 
To drive the messages home, he then mentioned that he has seen multiple dead bodies in the past. This inflated attempt missed the mark. Incredulous, the court asked what he meant by having seen multiple dead bodies. Nakache answered that he once saw a dead man in an alleyway, in addition to several dead bodies on the road in Asia, with their faces planted as a result of car accidents. It warrants mentioning that car accidents are not crimes. The court is unimpressed. If any of that were true, he would not have been frightened by the mere fact of seeing a neighbor give him the finger. On what basis did he fear that Mr. Epstein was a potential murderer? The fact that he went for quiet walks with his kids? The fact that he socialized with the other young parents on the street? If that is the standard, we should all fear that our neighbors are killers in waiting. Hide your kids, hide your wives. We are in mortal danger. Did he, did he really, did the judge just really quote Anton Dodson? Did the judge just really quote Anton Dodson? That's awesome. That's awesome. Go watch. I'll link that one in a bubble. Go watch that one. The same comments apply to the events of April 8th. The court does not even call it an interaction because there was none between the parties. This was a non-event. Still, Mr. Nakache claims that, for a moment, while sitting on his motorcycle, he feared that Mr. Epstein might intentionally run him over and kill him. Why? Why would his neighbor choose to maniacally murder him in the most gruesome fashion? No actual reason is given. Instead, Mr. Nakache mentions that he might have, just like we saw happen in Laval this week. This was a reference to the as-of-yet-motiveless, heart-wrenching killing of children in Laval by an STL bus driver. The incident was fresh. It had occurred just days prior. It was an unspeakable tragedy that traumatized an entire nation. His comparison of Mr. Epstein to the child-killing bus driver was unhinged, insensitive, and opportunistic. It was unjustified and completely distinguishable. The comment further showed that the complainant's account is overly dramatic and theatrical. This deplorable Laval reference is worthy of an eye roll that could sever both optical nerves. Mr. Nakache is an intelligent, mature, and educated man. He knew that there was no reason whatsoever for the accused to try and kill him on that night. His claim to that effect in his testimony was a weak throwaway line designed only to show that he feared that the accused was a dangerous man. His attempt failed. The complainant describes his neighborhood as fairly car-centric. Considered as a whole, the evidence unequivocally demonstrates that the complainants have a profound disdain for young children playing in the street. This is evidenced by Michael's testimony, his description of the events, later objectively shown by video evidence, his written comments in his PDF statement, and the history of the events. When asked in cross-examination if it bothered him that kids played in the street, he answered, not entirely. Then he quickly added that the kids in his neighborhood are particularly bad because they block the street and refuse to move, which contradicts his own video evidence. They treated the street as an extension of their personal property. He further added that this is a symptom of bad parenting. He then expanded on his philosophy by opining that people only move to the suburbs in order to have a backyard. If they wish to play in the street, they could do so downtown. The absurdity of such a statement is self-evident. He complained about how other unrelated neighbors leave their dog unleashed on their front lawn, even though they have a fenced backyard. When asked in cross-examination if he gets along with his neighbors, he evaded the question and repeatedly refused to give a clear answer. This backdrop permeates his entire testimony and affects his credibility. Even in the video files, Nakache remitted to the police. When it comes to the clips showing the children playing in the street, the complainant named the files Bad Baconsfield Neighborhood and Bad Baconsfield Neighborhood Extended. These labels speak volumes. His description of the March 25th scene was completely inaccurate and misleading. When describing the gathering, even though it had no bearing on any of the issues at bar, Nakache also scolded all the neighbors for being together at the height of the pandemic while mask mandates were in place and while you shouldn't mix with people. This gratuitous comment further demonstrated how he holds his neighbors in contempt and how he feels morally superior to them. The evidence shows that the complainant's family repeatedly contacted the police about the perceived inappropriate conduct of their neighbors. Evidently, the police did not want to pursue the matter. 
the complainants appear to have enough free time on their hands to sift through video footage, hoping to find something devastating, and then decry as abhorrent the simple fact that a young family walks up the street. Perhaps they should reflect on whether or not the suburb life is for them. Legal Implications the resentment between the Nakaches and the other neighbors extending beyond the Epstein family is mutual. The accused did not attempt to deny that. To be clear, it is not a crime to dislike a neighbor. It is not a crime to express it. After all, the evidence demonstrates that the complainants may have incited their neighbor's disdain by driving recklessly and endangering their young children. What matters is whether or not the accused committed any of the prohibited actions listed in the law. There is no evidence that Mr. Epstein watched, followed, or monitored the complainants, nor did he repeatedly communicate with them. Obviously, the accused often walked in front of the complainants' home. That is understandable, even inevitable. They are neighbors. They live a few houses apart. The accused has an active lifestyle which includes frequent walks with or without his family. Staring at your neighbor's home is not illegal. It does not attract criminal liability. As mentioned above, the court cannot conclude that Mr. Epstein was filming the complainant's home. That being said, even if he had, such actions would not amount to criminal harassment in the case at bar. Although filming someone may conceivably constitute criminal harassment in certain circumstances, there is no baseline prohibition from filming a neighbor's home from a public location. Mr. Epstein never approached the Nakache home. On the impugned dates, he was across the street, nowhere near the house. Had he chosen to film or photograph their home from that vantage point in broad daylight, it would amount to nothing at all. He was not on their property. He was not monitoring their comings or goings. He was not watching their activities. He was not peering into their home. He was not using a zoom lens. Finally, Mr. Epstein acknowledges having given Nakache the finger on May 18th, 2021. The video evidence shows the sequence. Incidentally, the accused was nowhere near the complainant. Epstein was across the street, dozens of meters away, and he kept walking. To be abundantly clear, it is not a crime to give someone the finger. Flipping the proverbial bird is a God-given, charter-enshrined right that belongs to every red-blooded Canadian. It may not be civil, it may not be polite, it may not be gentlemanly. Nevertheless, it does not trigger criminal liability. Offending someone is not a crime. It is an integral component of one's freedom of expression. Citizens are to be thicker skinned, especially when they behave in ways that are highly likely to trigger such profanity, like driving too fast on a street where innocent kids are playing. Uh, guilty kids should be able to play in the street too. It's not, I don't know about this characterization of innocent kids. Yes, of course, all kids are usually considered innocent, but even bad kids playing in the street should not be run over by the Nakaches or anyone else. Being told to fuck off should not prompt a call to 911. On that topic, the evidence in the case at bar established that even after the accused's arrest, therefore after the period covered by these charges, Michael Nakache called the police again to report that Mr. Epstein's wife had given them the finger while walking on the street. This needs to stop. The complainants are free to clutch their pearls in the face of such an insult. However, the police department and the 911 dispatching service have more important priorities to address. The complainant's brother is fortunate that he was not charged with assault on March 25th. Similarly, both of his parents are lucky that they were not ticketed under the Highway Safety Code for driving recklessly in the presence of children. Finally, based on the evidence in the case at bar, Michael Nakache is fortunate that he was not charged with uttering death threats on May 18th. The complainants should check all those in the victory column. Conclusion Having considered the evidence as a whole, it is common ground that the Crown has failed to prove the accused's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. In the modern-day vernacular, people often refer to a criminal case as being thrown out. 
Obviously, this is little more than a figurative expression. Cases aren't actually thrown out in the literal or physical sense. Nevertheless, in the specific circumstances of this case, the court is inclined to actually take the file and throw it out the window, which is the only way to adequately express my bewilderment with the fact that Mr. Epstein was subjected to an arrest and a fulsome criminal prosecution. Alas, the courtrooms of the Montreal courthouse do not have windows. A mere verdict of acquittal will have to suffice. For these reasons, the accused is found not guilty on all charges. Justice D. Galliot Satos. <sighs> Jeez, guys. There's... We need to we need to have a new term, not just Karen's anymore. It's going to be Karen Nakache. Jeez, don't behave like a Nakache, guys. That that's terrible. There was this is just a family living as a family, children playing in the street. This is like that video where that other Karen made some young lady wash off her chalk drawing in the street because it's vandalism. Ah. Uh. I don't know what is, is there too much lead in the air? Were these people abused as children? I don't understand how we get to this point. We have an entire family of people who are harassing everybody else in the neighborhood with their unfounded righteousness, their incorrect righteousness, their, their wrongchousness. Jeez. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that story. And uh, don't be an Akache. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments below.